Welcome to Dig Deeper episode four. It's great to have uh, all of you joining us both on the webinar uh, and also on live stream and also welcome to those of you who are listening on the podcast later. Um, we are in Mark's gospel as we've been journeying with over the last few weeks and uh, and because it's the winter's drawing in um, Stephen's brought his whiskey now, I'm a non-violent pacifist kind of guy, but this whiskey flask was my father-in-law's when he was in the army. This is his army whiskey flask. How about that? It looks like the kind of whiskey flask that um, in the movies, like if he puts it in his breast pocket. And yeah, it saves shot. you. It, it, yeah, it saves. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it's made of metal. Um, and I've got my um, pale ale working my way through. So uh, welcome to those of you joining us. If you're having a beverage with us, then uh, welcome to you. We're in Mark's Gospel and... Uh, we are, as you know, we're trying to look through Mark's gospel to look at what that might look like for our lives and how we might live differently. This is not simply an intellectual exercise. This is a way of us engaging with, um, with, the, with the person of Jesus and what kind of life that calls us to. Um, so we're taking our lead from Mark's gospel, Mark chapter two. We're taking our lead from the passage that we read the previous week. Uh, the previous Sunday, and uh, Stephen is going to be reading from um, a translation from David Bentley Hart. David Bentley Hart. Stephen, Mark chapter 2, verse 18 onwards. Okay, and John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the sons of the bridal chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? For such time as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And then in that day, they will fast. And no one sews a patch of unfulled cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the fitting tears away from it, the new from the old, and the worse rent appears. And no one puts new wine in old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the wineskins, and the wine is lost, and the wineskins also but rather new wine into new wineskins. And it happened that he passed through fields of grain on the Sabbath and his disciples began to pluck the ears of grain as they made their way. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why do they do what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And he says to them, did you never read what David did when he was in need in Hungary as well as those with him? How he entered the house of God in the days of the chief priest Abithar and ate the loaves of the bread of presentation, which is unlawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave them also to those who were with him. And he says to them, the Sabbath came about for the sake of man, not man for the sake of the Sabbath. Thus, the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And then. Christendom in all its wisdom has decided that that's the end of that passage. So oh, okay. So read it's on. Not the end, but we'll pretend it's the end. No, 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 let's not pretend that by its, by, by as a beginning, as a starter is already interesting. Go on then read on to where you think the passage comes to a natural end. Well, the, it doesn't. Mark is written in one, in one breath. So let's pretend that there isn't a passage break and the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And he entered a synagogue. And there was a man who had a hand that had been withered and they observed him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath that they might bring an accusation against him. And he said to the man having a withered hand, stand up. And he says to them, is it permissible on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a soul or to kill? And they were silent and looking around at them with anger, mortified at the hardness of their hearts. He says to the man, stretch forth the hand and he stretched it forth and his hand was restored. And going out, the Pharisees immediately exchanged counsel with the Herodians against him that they might destroy him. There endeth the lesson. Now you can take a break. <laughs> yeah, and that's where I wish I divided it when I came to planning the sermon series. You gotta watch so these chapter breaks. They are, they've colonized our imaginations. They've made us think these stories are... I've got loads of examples of this. We, we'll keep pointing them out, but yeah, please do. Always, just read it as if there isn't a chapter break and see if it changes the way you read it. So, so Stephen, for the uninitiated, why do we have them in the first place? Why do you know? Obviously, they uh, in the original Greek they are written as a, uh, these 
the gospels that are written as whole text punctuation has to be read into it yeah um but then we have these chapter headings and even um the chapter numbers and subheadings all the way through what's going on here what, what were the redactors doing to the text oh, it's a, it's um it's a technology that was invented to literally help people stay on the same page i think it i think it might have come from translators from monks you know when they were transcribing and they were all trying to make sure they didn't miss any lines or miss any words i mean it's not look i'm not saying these are the evil i'm just saying let's watch out it's a bit like watch for the way that your your you know, your mobile phone or your Instagram affects the way you communicate. Okay. It, it puts boundaries on your communication. And it, you know, think of how like an emoji affects, it, it opens up new ways of communicating, but it also limit it blocks down others. Well, chapters and verses are an invention that has been imposed on the text for reasons that had to do with translation and reading aloud. So the uh, monks would read while you ate the monk would, a head monk would read out loud while you ate and you had to kind of make sure that it was always a set amount of time, right? And so that was a good way of staying kind of okay. everybody on one page. But that's it really. I mean, it's not a, yeah, it's it's not the gospel. The, the chapters and verses are not themselves the gospel. <laughs> but, but the reason we need to be careful is because we read the passage differently. Yeah, exactly. So what it's done is it, so a, a good example here is, we read about uh, the Pharisees getting mad at the disciples for picking grain on the Sabbath. And then Jesus says, oh, uh, you know, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. And then we stop and uh, we have a week if we're lucky. I mean, very rarely will, will sermons kind of go line by line through a, a gospel right. anyway. But right. if, you're, if you're lucky, you might start the next week with the, with the next verse. And you've had a whole week to forget what happened beforehand. You think that that's a separate story, but it's not. It's all one story about Jesus showing his authority over the Sabbath. And at the end of that story, they, that is when they plot to kill him. That's when they want to kill him. He asserts that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, or he's the son of man, which is a phrase he takes on to himself, which has, I think I must mention this last week. It's that, that Daniel figure. Yeah. You know, the great authority figure who comes out of the, in the book of Daniel, he's this figure that shows up and the Lord says to him, come sit at my right hand and have authority over the world. And Jesus shows up. And that was not a figure that the, the Messiah wasn't meant to be the son of man, right? So people weren't expecting that the Messiah would also be the son of man. Jesus puts those two together, basically. And he takes that phrase for himself, which is, to be honest, the son of man is a much bigger phrase than the Messiah, right? So Messiah could have been like a Braveheart, freedom fighter type character. Okay. The son of man is like a semi, he's like a divine character who rules the universe, which is quite a bit different than Braveheart. <laughs> and quite a claim to make, right? So Jesus makes this claim about himself. So he, he asserts his authority over the Sabbath by letting his followers eat food. And he claims that he owns the Sabbath and he can tell the Sabbath what it's there for. And then to drive the point home, he goes into a synagogue, which is the heart and soul of the Pharisees and keeping the law. And they think they're lords of the Sabbath. And then he demonstrates his authority. There's an ill, impure person in the synagogue, which is already a kind of a problem for the synagogue. This would be a source of embarrassment for them and cleanliness. And he shows his authority over that. And he, heals that man and it's at that point that the pharisees want to kill him wow they see the healing they don't doubt the healing happened they see it and they hate jesus for it we've, and that talked, point, they kill him. we've talked before about the fast pace of mark it's never yeah. really struck me before how we're only um six verses into chapter three and already yeah. conspiracy to kill exactly so yeah. quick and also something that Bentley Hart does, which yeah, this is another thing to do with English translation is we've kind of ironed out. I think I might've mentioned this before. The way Mark is written is quite, it's more like listening to somebody tell us a fast paced story. Yeah. Up, yeah, yeah. And the, the tense has changed. So even in the reading I had, sometimes it's, and Jesus said to the Pharisees and other times it's, and he says to them, and he says to them, and it's yeah. like, it, it swaps back and forth. And yeah, yeah. 
Bentley Hart keeps that in there, whereas everybody else just irons that out and makes it yeah, much more once, proper. Once it's sound proper, yeah. yeah. So where do we start? I know we've, we've, we've talked already about the Sabbath. Maybe that's where we start, about Jesus' interaction around the Sabbath. Well, what about, God? okay, fine. But also the wineskin business, because you had to preach on that. Well, and I don't, it's always hard to talk about. Well, and I don't, uh, I don't envy you at all having to well, talk. Well, no, I mean, and I, I hope I did it justice, but it's, a, it, I mean, this whole passage from verse 18, and rightly as you identified through to the beginning of chapter three, yeah um is deeply challenging when you're trying to um trying to work out jesus relationship with the law right because of course what? the famous verse is that you know I, I didn't come to abolish the law i came to fulfill it um, well he doesn't say that in mark does he well no he doesn't um so the question but at the same time we're trying to wrestle you know i think we we in the church have often essentially in all but tokenistic practice we have abandoned the old testament right in right, favor right. of the much nicer version that we have yeah. that's fair in, yeah in the yeah. new yeah and and so because we don't really i mean even even in a church where you might have um uh, a psalm, an Old Testament reading, and a New Testament reading, which is very common in the Anglican Church and, and other churches. It's rare that you would then have the preacher choose to necessarily preach on the Old Testament passage. It's much no, more common yeah. that the New, New Testament passage is preached on. Right. Yeah. Partly because we don't know what to do about that, and um, don't know what to do about the God that is revealed through the Old Testament, as opposed to the God that is revealed through Jesus, and they've got a conflict. So when Jesus is relating to the law, yeah, it's very tempting to see him as someone that is throwing the law out because it already fits with our, okay, with what we've done. You know, we, we like the Jesus permission to kind of, well, Jesus wasn't really that interested in the law either. Neither, neither are we, because we don't really do much with it. And right. Uh, but to be fully, fully Christian is to embrace the, the whole canon of scripture. And but um, even when he was, well, the law is not the same as the Old Testament, by the way. So, Okay, let's talk about that. I mean, the Old Testament is a whole collection of books of which the books of the law are one part of the Old Testament. Yeah, true. So the Psalms aren't the law. Proverbs isn't the law. The prophets aren't the law. Yeah. Right? So, um, and I think the law means more than just books. It also means the whole apparatus like that the Pharisees had around trying to keep it. So that was also considered the law. Yeah. So Christians, we don't read those books either. Like we don't have that whole like extra accumulated body of knowledge, which was trying to keep the law. Yeah. The law as well. Yeah. And I talked about that on Wednesday. We had a right. midweek service and talked about how um, what Jesus was challenging here was not the essence of the, you know, the, the Ten Commandment law about the Sabbath, but all the stuff that had been extrapolated in what the yeah. Jewish teachers created, the Midrash, the the exactly. expository work around the law. I mean, you notice he doesn't abolish the Sabbath. He doesn't say the Sabbath is stupid and must be destroyed. Yeah. He just says, no, it's just, it's there to serve humans. Um, so he's putting the law kind of in its place, right? Rather than abolishing it. So, yeah. And so you could say, so this is how you say, well, Jesus, he kept the law or he, he fulfilled the law by putting it in its place. Um, and yeah. its place, by the way, is not that important. <laughs> so so what is, as, as Christians, what is the place of understanding the law, albeit defined by that, those particular parts of the Old Testament that we, that are the, the law? What, what place does it have in our lives then? Well, uh, the earliest... So the New Testament is essentially a whole series of footnotes on the Old Testament, right? So the New Testament is constantly trying to situate itself in some kind of conversation with the body of, of traditions that came from the Hebrew scriptures. So, I mean, you just threw that out there. Right. Like, that's the first I've heard of it. So it's, it's like, oh, I love that phraseology though, the way that you talked about it being, it's a, you know, it's the footnotes, it's wrestling with its position within just the way that you phrased that was so, this, like, so very helpful. I think there's probably, I mean, I might be exaggerating here, but frankly, not much when I say there's probably not a single page in the New Testament that doesn't quote 
or allude to something in the Old Testament. Okay. So it's just everywhere. And it's way more than you might get your NIV study Bible and you, you, your cross reference study Bible. And yeah. you will only mention a small portion of them, right? Okay. And there's quite a lot of like words and stuff that would, it's not a direct reference, but it would call to mind. Like just the, a, a good example in Mark 1 1, where he says, in the beginning, the gospel. He's not like directly quoting Genesis. But Mark sure wants you to think of Genesis when he yeah. said in the beginning, right? So it's an allusion to the text. He's put his, he's situating Mark's gospel inside that story of Genesis, right? He's saying, I'm about to tell you a story that has something to do with the creation story. And so the, the Hebrew scriptures and the traditions are what gives the New Testament its meaning and its context, right? And Jesus's incarnation was, he was incarnated as a Hebrew. He wasn't incarnated as a barbarian Gentile who came rolling into Palestine and said, oh, you crazy Jews, you got it all wrong. That he incarnated into a Hebrew yeah. tradition. So he's not, he's not abolishing that stuff, but he definitely is not just a big rubber stamp on everything that has come before. So it's a little bit like when you say all scripture is useful for teaching and correcting, right? And fundamentalists will always go, oh, you see it all the scripture is useful. So it's all God breathed. It's all useful. So you should treat, you know, the book of Joshua, which says dash babies heads against the rocks. You should treat that with the exact same authority as when Jesus said, you should love your enemies. And, and if you don't do that, then you, you hate the Bible and you hate scripture and all this. That's just nonsense, utter nonsense, because um, some of the teaching points of scripture, some of the usefulness of scripture is to show you what God is not actually like, <laughs> right? So it's useful. <laughs> like, so Jesus will say like, oh, you've heard that it was said an eye for an eye, but I'm telling you, don't do that. Or, yeah. you know, uh, you've heard that it was said, like that when James and John want to call down fire on the, uh, on the um, Samaritan village, and they say, hey, can we call down fire as in the days of Elijah, which is a reference to First Kings. Yeah. In First Kings, the hero Elijah calls down fire on God's enemies. Yeah. And Jesus rebukes his disciples and says, no, we don't do that kind of thing. Huh. So like it's it, the, the story of Jesus and his disciples is absolutely you, it gets its meaning from the story of First Kings. It is not an affirmation of First Kings. OK. Does that make sense? It does. But I think what's interesting is that um, what, to be consistent, as far as I see, to be consistent yeah. in terms of your view of who Christ is and, and his role, and a Trinitarian view is to say yeah. that when God speaks in the Old Testament, so does Jesus. Well, no, but that's not really true. Okay, so, go on. God, we're going way off mark. Well, we're not really, because this is all kind of about the son of man business and authority. This is actually the, this is actually the point. I've realized we're not going off piece. This is actually the point because what Jesus is doing is he's saying, I'm the one who's going to tell you. He's not saying whenever you hear God speak in the old Testament, that is God. What he's saying is when you hear me speak, that is God. So the Old Testament is reframed. And so sometimes there are some voices in the Old Testament that claim God said something and Jesus says, nope. Right? And it, only if you have this inherited tradition that says, you know, it's infallibility or that the Bible is some magic book that fell out of heaven fully formed. Like it challenges that view of the Bible, but that view is a made up view that, Jesus didn't hold and the even the Pharisees didn't hold that. That's like a modern evangelical view, which was invented in the kind of 1910 or something. Like that's not the hill that I want to die on. Like Jesus does actually reframe or change and sometimes flatly contradicts stuff that happened in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. which we're told God said. And he says, No, I don't do that. So that's part of the offense, right? It is offensive, and people are having their their worship of the Bible being challenged because he's saying, well, the Bible was made for humans, not humans for the Bible. Basically. Yeah. Okay. And so this is why we have this thing called the Christocentric. Do you ever talk about the Christocentric hermeneutic? 
go for it. I, I can understand what it might mean, but for the sake of our listeners, at least. I mean, because the hermeneutic is just like your method for read for interpreting scripture, right? Yeah. So everybody has a hermeneutic and this is your method for interpreting it. And a Christocentric one is, well, we're going to, it's like a Christ lens. We're going to put on our Christ spectacles and we're going to read the Bible. It's like, you know, you, you get Jesus to hold your hand through the Old Testament. And, uh, and the early Christians, they found Jesus in the Old Testament all the time. And they, they would find like evidence of Jesus in the Old Testament. Hmm. And then they would elevate those parts. And the parts where they didn't find evidence of Jesus, they would say, well, that's also useful for teaching and correcting. Hmm. But we're not going to elevate those bits as if they are speaking with the voice of God. Hmm. Yeah. And so it's like that. And because they don't think that Jesus was just a clever teacher, right? That's what part of this whole thing is about with the son of man business. It's like, he's not just a clever teacher who has an interesting argument, which you can weigh against other people's interesting arguments. He's part of the package of Jesus is, oh yeah, I'm God. <laughs> yeah. When you hear me, you're hearing God speak. So yeah. deal with it. Yeah. And so the offense is definitely an offense of like, who is this man? Like, do we really have to you see if Jesus had just showed up at the synagogue and had a little argument with them about the nature of the Sabbath, that would be one thing, but he doesn't, he doesn't show up and have a, a good natured argument with them. He shows up and said, I'm God. Let me tell you what the Sabbath is, is here for zap. And he heals somebody. And so he's instantly made himself way more important than just another teacher of the law. Yeah. But he doesn't contradict the law. Well, he doesn't contradict. No, because he says, well, um, he's effectively saying, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the law was here for. I, yeah. And he does it over and over again. He says, yeah. oh, you, you had the law for this reason. But, you know, he, when he, we're going to get to that when he talks about divorce. And he says, you know, well, Moses let you have divorce because your hearts were hard. But let me tell you what it was really all about. Okay. He puts himself. So he's not like saying... Um, there's no such thing as law. He's just saying, I'm going to tell you what the law was meant to be there for. Yeah. yeah. So then in our relationship with something like the Sabbath. Yeah. You know, um, it's actually quite on vogue at the moment to talk about Sabbath. Um, people talking about finding rest, particularly in a yeah. COVID world, which feels pretty intense right now. And I love Sabbath. Okay. Yeah. And we for you, it. how does that work out then? Well, Jesus doesn't abolish the Sabbath. Right. He's saying to the Pharisees and to the uh, synagogue who refuses to heal somebody, he's like, you're grinding down human lives. The Sabbath was meant to be a time of rest and healing. And you're making it a burden. Hmm. So stop it. He's not abolishing the Sabbath at all. He's, ma he's making the Sabbath be the best Sabbath it can be. Giving it its true purpose. Yeah. I was reading in the... Um... Uh, in the Ched Myers book that we, oh, yeah. um, that you referred to the uh, commentary on um, Binding the Strongman. Yeah. Um, and, um, I was reading about that and they, he gave an interesting perspective and I, I'm wondering if I've, I've understood it well enough is that Jesus was also doing something that they called, um, that he calls uh, uh, civil disruption, I think is the phrase he used while he's walking through the cornfield. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and his argument is that, is that the the um the way that food was cultivated produced and distributed was controlled by yeah the religious yes yes they and, are land. and usually i mean quite capitalist really i mean it was like a monopoly over the yeah. food produce of the yeah. land yeah. and um and and of course who gets usually done over is the poor and um and so jesus is saying well hang on a minute we're we're hungry yeah as as was david so he's quoting that episode with, with king yeah. david yeah. um he said we're hungry you know but your your control and your tight-knit control over who gets what and who gets what earnings and from the produce of the land is is actually harming people so there's, there's almost two yeah. things going on there's there's an argument around the law of the sabbath but there's also something about the law of the land about what the what land was created for right because we keep thinking of like um again we're trapped into thinking that there's a difference between religion and politics and that pharisees are all about religion 
you know, and the Romans were all about politics. I'm like, no, no, like the pharisaical laws were about eating and money and killing. And like, that was all the things that we now think of as political okay. food distribution and economic systems and military intervention. Well, the Pharisees were running that. And they were saying, this is the law and this is how we do things. So their religious interpretation was political, right? There wasn't a difference. They were the rulers of the land. The Romans were overarching as the emperor, but the day-to-day -day life was governed by the Pharisees. Yeah, because the Romans gave them permission, an agency to run that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a big, you know, you can't micromanage people and the Pharisees are, are ruling the kind of day-to-day -day life of the Jews. Well, you and, see that in the way the Romans treat Jesus at the crucifixion is that they say, Look, you guys run your own, you know, if you think he's yeah. guilty, well, we'll sort, sort it out. out. You sort it out. Yeah. So it's, it, you just have to sort of stop thinking that they're just religious and then there's some other politics walking around. It's like, no, no, there's just the Pharisees. They run everything. And, um, and yeah, the, the eating the grain. I mean, again, we kind of, we're, we're, we forget that matters of eating for us, like it's very rare. I doubt you know anybody who's close to starving to death, hmm. right? Like we have poverty in this world, in our, you know, Western societies, but it's very rare that the kind of poverty we see involves actually literally starving to death. Right. And this is the kind of poverty that, this is why food is so important. Jesus creates food out of nothing. His disciples need to eat food and it's being owned and monopolized by the Pharisee. He even puts it in his prayer. It's, like, we kind of forget that. Like, for me, my daily bread means, oh, man, I'd really love a Mars bar. <laughs> for them, our daily bread means, like, I am going to die if I don't eat this, you know? And, and we forget that, that the kinds of people Jesus was appealing to were those poor people, which the, the word poor was the, the word you'd use for people who didn't know where their resources were going to come from the next day. And that's the people that Jesus was with. And so, so yeah, it's, it's very highly political when Jesus allows his followers to eat food. It's like them stealing, you know, from Tesco's because they're starving. They're breaking the law. Yeah. Yeah. Of the land, the political law they're breaking. Yeah. But uh, upholding the, the heart of the religious law. You know, and, and then the Pharisees are mad because like, oh, you're breaking the law. And he says, no, they got to eat. And, it's a bit like, you know, even in the, Sab in the Old Testament, if your ox falls into a well, you're allowed to bring him out on a Sabbath. It's kind of like if your human livelihood is in danger. Yeah. Because if your ox falls into a well, then you're not going to have anything to eat the next day. You're not, nothing's going to help you plow the field, right? Yeah. So it, it's like Jesus is reminding them, no, this is life or death. Yeah. People are hungry, so I'm going to let them do it because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I get to choose. John, when I when I talk about like the by like oh the maybe the Old Testament isn't as important as you think it is or something like what does that make you think? Yeah, I think I I would uphold a an understanding of Scripture that is God breathed the whole of Scripture being God breathed, right? Um, but I wouldn't go down the line of the kind of inerrant without right. error because i recognize that we don't have a quranic view of scripture yeah we right. don't we don't believe in the kind of download and no and we believe in human authorship and i do think that by god i do think there's a message here about god's grace that is it that all the way through creation god has been is self-limiting in the way that he interacts with his creation right so crea creation in and of itself yeah is a self limiter on God because he binds his actions within time. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so he's, he in as, as God, he, he confines his actions within, within the perimeters of time and space. Yeah. He doesn't dominate micromanage. Right. Right. But then, but then we also see his, his interaction with, with speaking as an old Testament prophet. Uh, through the Old Testament prophets to his people. So he limits his interactions with his people through the prophetic of the Old Testament prophets. Like that was God's word at the time. He and he limits, even, and, and of course we get the ultimate example of self-limitation through Christ, that he limits his presence on earth within hu the human frame that is subject to hunger and, and, um, 
uh, and il uh, and illness and death. You know, he he's subject to the same hum human limitations that we are, uh, yeah. and so therefore, scripture itself is God limiting Himself within human authorship. Well, and also yeah, exactly, and also so, so people have pointed out. I can't remember their names. But people have pointed out like. Similar to the way that Jesus submits to death, he allows humans to humiliate and kill him. God allows people to misrepresent him. <laughs> you know, that's, you can, you can do that and you don't fall down dead. Like God isn't the kind of God that he doesn't actually micromanage his own image, his own reputation. Clearly, <laughs> if God exists, <laughs> if God exists and if God is anything like what we think Jesus, you know, said God was like, then one of the things you learn about God is he doesn't micromanage his reputation because God doesn't have a good name right now. <laughs> and the people are doing stuff in God's name right now that are, is appalling. Right. And so if God does exist, then that God is not a God that is going to drop, make you drop down dead if you misrepresent his name. And I think that happens even in scriptures but the scriptures are a preservation of a whole group of people. Just like the New Testament is the documents from a church of followers. The Old Testament is itself also the collection. It's like a big conversation between a whole group of people spanning thousands of years. And they're having an argument about God. They're having a debate about God. The priests are having a debate, an argument, and the prophets are having an argument. And the Old Testament is fighting with each other. Yeah. Priests and the kings will be like, this is the way it is. And then along comes Jeremiah or Amos or, you know, and they always say, you prophet, you kings and priests, you think you've got it all sorted out, but you've forgotten. The Lord says, I hate your sacrifices and the, you've forgotten justice and all this. Right. And what happens is Jesus comes along and the Hebrew scriptures is a, kind of like a big argument about what the nature of God is like. And that's part of scripture. It's preserved. That argument itself is scripture. And then along comes Jesus and he's part of that conversation. And he says, it's it. You've got to pay attention. I said that Jesus uh, is quote, the new Testament quotes the old Testament all the time. Look what Jesus actually quotes. He doesn't quote the priests and the kingly passages. He always quotes the prophet passages. Uh, and it's like he, he sides with the prophetic voice. So it's not as easy as saying, oh, we don't need the Old Testament anymore because Jesus is here. What we say is, ah, how did Jesus use the Old Testament? What, what did he affirm? Can we affirm what he affirmed? And we don't affirm what he didn't affirm. And, and, and he always sides with, beginning with, you know, in, the, in the Luke where he opens up the book of Isaiah. And he sides with the prophets all the time. Yeah. And that's so he's not departing from Hebrew scriptures. He is absolutely using them and part of them and fulfilling them. But you have to remember those Hebrew scriptures themselves contain more than one voice. And Jesus amplifies the prophetic voice and he turns the volume down on the priestly voice, which is the ones all about sacrifices and Sabbath and purity laws. Right. And he, he dials those ones down and he dials up, take care of the poor, don't hate your enemies, let foreigners live amongst you. Like those are the voices he amplifies. So if you want to be really responsible with your Bible, you have to be responsible with the way Jesus treated the Bible. Wow. Yeah. So as you can imagine, the questions are flying in. Wow. Uh, so first question that came up is um, uh, someone saying, these are really interesting ideas about how we interpret scripture. Are there any rules of thumb for when uh, you could go too far? Don't your ideas on hermeneutics make scripture too malleable? Well, first of all, they're not my ideas. <laughs> I didn't invent them. <laughs> um, they are, uh, this is the New Testament's way. This is how the New Testament theologians who wrote the New Testament, this is how they read their scriptures. Um, this, is, this is how the gospels introduced the Old Testament to their readers, right? So, and Paul is doing this. In Paul's letters as well. So uh, I didn't invent this at all. And then this was the early church. The early church, this was their approach as well. So, and then there's always been people who, who follow this. Like I'm not, I didn't invent this. The Christological hermeneutic is not a Stephen Backhouse invention. But you can see how people are wrestling with this if they, you know, this is, you know, well, that, that, if, if we, 
Well, of course, of course, we're wrestling with it. But I mean, so, so what? So what are those rules of thumb that help well, us? The rule of thumb would be um, don't affirm what Jesus didn't affirm, and you know, and really, like, really be willing to to do that. Like Jesus did not affirm calling down fire on your enemies. You know, even though there are people in the Old Testament where God sends fire to them, Jesus didn't do it, and so we now have like, all right, that's a problem. Right? That is a conflict. I totally recognize it's uncomfortable. But by the way, so is the other side, because like, so my side means that you calls into question some of those passages where God seems to kill his enemies. Okay. Well, the other side has to somehow say that God commands genocide and that that's a good thing. It's not like my side, it's not like your side is free of moral problems. <laughs> yeah. Right. So my problem is I don't take Joshua literally true. Your problem is, you think genocide is a morally good thing. Hmm. So, you know what I mean? Like yeah. <laughs> we have to kind of weigh that up. So uh, that would be a rule of thumb is affirm what Jesus affirmed. Don't, don't affirm what he didn't affirm. And um, that's one rule of thumb for sure. Anything else? Well, you go too far when you, well, you go too far when you don't read the Old Testament at all, or you don't value it. Because I'm a, if I'm trying to affirm what Jesus affirmed, then I basically should be living with the Hebrew scriptures all the time. <laughs> Which, by the way, I'm not. I, you know, I'm not. Right. Well, I'm there not. wasn't there wasn't even any New Testament at all. So the only scriptures Jesus had to refer to were the Hebrew scriptures. Exactly, exactly. exactly. So, like to to say to to kind of say the line that I'm saying. I mean, for example, like you know, do you know who? Um, uh, not Maltman. What's his name? He's an Old Testament scholar. Maltman. Well, um. Oh, I forget his name. It'll come to me when I'm talking. Like there are Christian Christ-centered Hebrew uh, scholars of the Hebrew scriptures who are like, you know, absolutely like um, uh, Richard Hayes is a good example. H-A-Y-S. Yeah. Know. Go and have a look at that book, you know, and where he writes about like the Old Testament that Jesus used. <laughs> and um, like this view does not lead you away from the Old Testament. It actually leads you into it. Right. Because if you really want to affirm what Jesus affirmed, then you're pretty much going to be just always living with the prophets and the Psalms and those kind of texts. So that's, you know, I, I, I would like to say that this isn't the same as saying Jewish scriptures are stupid and we don't need them anymore. Yeah. That's not what this is saying. Yeah. So uh, another question has come in. If Jesus can redefine bits of the Old Testament, can Paul do this too? If the New Testament revises the Old Testament, what role does Paul play in this? Well, see, because I think what's happening is people's um, view of scripture is being challenged. Uh, so you present this to modern Christians and they get all they get worried because they're like, oh, you're changing scripture. Um, but what's happening is we're just attacking a view that itself is very modern. So okay. Nobody in the Bible had the same view of the scriptures as us modern Christians have, right? So Paul doesn't think that the scriptures cannot be rethought or reimagined. Like he, he changes scripture around. Um, he'll quote something he'll be like, oh, as it says somewhere in, you know, the scriptures. And then he'll give like a, a not very accurate quote. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he'll do that a lot. And he's much more free and, and easy with these texts than we are because he didn't have a view of them as if they were this rock solid thing. He, for him, I think they were part of the conversation. They were part of the air he was breathing. They were living and breathing and they were part of the people's memory as well. And so he's, he is actually, you know, it's interesting to look at like, what does Paul, what is Paul always having to defend against? Okay. So Paul is constantly having to defend against accusations that he doesn't like the law at all. If you look at Paul, he's constantly having to defend against his, his accusers are always saying, you don't like the law, you have nothing to do with the law. And he's always basically trying to show how he does have a relationship to the law. Which is interesting given his background prior to his conversion. So that shows you that when people heard Paul talking, their natural assumption was he didn't care about the law at all. Okay. Because this was a charge that stuck. This was a charge that followed him around everywhere he went. And he was always having to defend against it. 
Yeah. Which makes me think, huh, to hear Paul preach and to be in a Paul, uh, an early church, an early New Testament church was to be in an, in an environment that felt like the danger, their danger was to avoid the, the law altogether. Yeah. And he's always trying to rein them back. Yeah. They weren't addicted to the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the teaching, a lot of the New Testament is like a teaching document trying to educate Gentiles about the Hebrew scriptures because they were tempted to not have them at all. So, and then the way they educated the Hebrew, the, about the Hebrew scriptures was to say, here is Jesus. He's in these texts. He quoted these texts. This is what he's doing. So you can't have Jesus without the scriptures. Yeah. So a couple of questions have come in on two very opposite ends of our, our conversation. One is going back to the Sabbath. So I thought we, uh, as that one came in before the other, I'll uh, address that one, uh, which is how should Christians interact with the Sabbath today? You talked about the fact that you love the Sabbath, yeah. um, uh, recognizing Jesus' lordship over it. So what does the Sabbath mean for us today? And they also said, thank you for the chat. It's really interesting, which is nice. If you want well, to thank you. I'm offer, glad. offer any uh, encouragements our way, then you're more than welcome. Um, well, I think it's, we got to pay attention to the fact that it is also malleable. Like the Sabbath that Jesus knew was what we would have called the Saturday. Yeah. And now we think of it as a Sunday. So already we've made a cultural shift. Yeah. Which is fine because I'm not a literalist, you know, Um but the idea of having a day of rest is that's what's important. If it's a Wednesday or if it's Sunday, if it's a Saturday, it doesn't really matter as long as you have one. And the idea that it's corporate, that the idea that everybody does it is important or that a lot of people do it. See, so, I'm, I'm still f forgetting that element of the call of Jesus is to something corporate. It's yeah. not individualistic. And I think we talked about that last week and that whether that is the acknowledgement of sin, whether that's the, uh, ex, um, whether that's the act of repentance whether that is the come and follow me that it's all about always about being being corporate and so again when we ask the question about sabbath um we we should do so with a corporate view yeah so it's not like you, everybody goes oh i'm going to choose a day and then i'm going to take that day off i don't think that's what that's not the point of the sabbath it's not a day off. It's a time when we, as a group of people who are living in a kingdom, decide this is how we're going to spend our resources and our time. And, and we, as a group of people, believe that this is important. Um, and so it's, it is that there's like a real social element to the Sabbath as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you prepare for it. Right. You get ready. You're like, all right, because I'm not going to work on Sunday, I will work hard on Saturday to make sure I'm ready. You know, that, that kind of thing. It's like you all pull together and you all those sort of actions i don't think they're like legalist they don't have to be legalistic actions right. they can be actions to try and preserve what's important about a community of people not being slaves to earning money all the time but also that there, there is a reality that human beings thrive when there are perimeters and boundaries not exactly. not not legalism and no, not have rules right. for their own sake, but actually there's perimeters within which we thrive. We thrive when we have patterns and rhythms to our life. Even the most disorganized ones of us, I include myself in that. We thrive when we have things yeah. in our life that we know that we hook ourselves to. Yeah. And I mean, again, I'd just like to point out that what Jesus does with the Sabbath here is he preserves the Sabbath by getting rid of the legalism. Yeah. Right. So he's like, no, the Sabbath is good. It's meant to bring you life. Stop being addicted to all your laws about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to come back to that first passage uh, in a moment about the fasting, because um, I really want to unpack that a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting, because, I mean, fa if we're talking about food, again, you know, me not eating a, a Mars bar, and I go, oh, I'm fasting. I've gone off chocolate for 40 days. <laughs> when these guys go fasting, they're like, they're risking death yeah it's, a, it's so, more important <laughs> so jesus jesus makes this point he said well why are they far what, they don't need to fast because the bridegroom is already with them and actually when the bridegroom's yeah. here you can be welcome to the wedding feast what in simplistic terms it feels like all jesus is saying is that what you know that the, the jewish understanding of fasting was to remind yourself of your dependence on god and therefore be drawn near to him 
that's how I read it. I may be wrong. You know, I, I don't want to BS you here because I don't know what the Jewish understanding of fasting was. So well, I'm I looked not... it up in preparation for my talk. Okay, cool. And it was that sense of uh, humbling yourself. Oh, okay, right. It was that if I if I refrain from eating, abstain from food, yeah, uh, I am more aware of my humanity, of my yeah, right. creatureliness yeah. in You're... the face of the creator. Or in spirit. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, but it's curious here that um, my only interpretation of this passage is that if fasting was a means, a Hebraic practice to enable us to be drawn near to God, what, again, what, what he's saying here is. Um, yeah. Well, he's saying, I'm here. I, I'm here. You yeah. don't need to do anything to be drawn near to me. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to be reminded of God's presence because I'm breathing my bad breath on you right now and you can smell it. <laughs> I, I mean, Jesus had breath. Like God had, you could smell God's breath, right? Yeah. 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 And we've not even talked about new wineskins. And... Well, that one is always confusing to me. I mean, I, I think he's maybe you remember more recently than I do about Ched Myers. He talks about it, but I think it's just some idioms. I think he's using just kind of local colloquialisms to sort of bring out that idea of like, um, get with the times, like you're using the wrong tools for the wrong time. So he's not saying um, fasting is bad and you should stop doing it. He's saying fasting is for a certain time. It's for the time when you're not near God, mm -hmm. but now that God is here, stop fasting. So he's not saying fasting is bad. He's just saying it's, you're using the wrong tool for the job. And in fact, by the way, he says, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be gone. So they'll need to fast again. Yeah. Yeah. So get ready. Like, you know, right now you're being filled up and then I'm going to go and I'm going to leave, you know, in, he'll tell us in John, he'll give his Holy spirit. He doesn't, I don't think he offers that in Mark. We'll see. But, um, but I think this stuff about, about new and old wine skins. I don't think it's that new skins or old skins. I don't think he's saying old skins are bad and new skins are, are good. I think he's just saying old skins have their time in their place. Right. That's new what skins have that time in their place. Yeah. Figure out which one you're in right now. Yeah. Stop bringing a knife to a gunfight. And the, the whole point about the old wine skins that once upon a time, they were new wine skins. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, actually exactly. there was a season when that, which you were doing, had purpose and had meaning and and gave life right but i have come and you cannot allow you need to be able to allow space for for me to do a new thing and can you see how this is relevant to our story about to us talking about hebrew scriptures that he's talking about the traditions he's he, this is all about the ancient traditions which are called the law <laughs> and he's saying the law had a time and a place and a purpose. It's not all bad. It wasn't all stupid. But some of those parts that you're trying to follow are not the right time right now. The times have changed. You know? Because they are human add-ons. They're human. They really are. Sometimes they claim to be from God, but they're from God in the way that God chose a people, right? So, I mean, this is the other thing is like, we keep forgetting how human we talk about if we say the scriptures were a human invention we us modern day kind of evangelical types think oh that's terrible you can't say that it's like well no that's how that's how the scriptures were god chose a people he didn't choose a book he yeah. chose a people and he said right you write your book like the history of those people in their conversation that is the scriptures yeah and those people are moving through history and they're changing and they're adapting and the early church, the New Testament, spends a lot of energy putting itself in that story. They don't claim they're inventing a new story. They claim we are part of this story, the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. And we're part of these people. Right. And yeah. they're, they're, they're really trying to. So for them to connect to the Hebrew people was the same as connecting to the Hebrew scriptures. Because the scriptures were the body that came, the, the knowledge that came from the people. What I talked about on Sunday was that. Actually, if God is doing a new thing amongst us at the moment in this season of real change for us as as a world with COVID and everything else. Yeah. We, you know, there's a lot of desire to, oh, I wish things were back the way they, they were. Right. 
Old and it's like, skin. actually, those are the old wineskins. Yeah, exactly. They don't work. And actually, maybe we need exactly. to start putting things in place. Things, and it's interesting about the wineskins and the patches and things uh, and the clothing, that it's like those things are the new patch on the old clothing and the new wine in the old. It's They are almost like containers. They are things that hold the new. Yeah. Um, and, and what I said on Sunday was actually yeah, right, right, right. Think, things in our life that we that are no longer fit for purpose because they do not hold the new things that God is doing. Yeah, exactly. And that doesn't and, mean that, that the old things were bad in their day. No. Yeah. I and mean, so this is a realignment of our priorities, a realignment of what are the things that contain the things that God is doing, the, the way that we use our yeah, time, that's good. the way that we use our the priorities that we work to, even the subconscious ones that we have in our lives, you know, that we work towards. Um, it feels to me like those are the things actually that in this time of COVID that we need to address is the fundamental that no matter, it's a bit like I gave this example on Sunday that I read a book about forming new habits and routines because all my routines and habits were out of the window as soon as lockdown right. happened. And, um, and no matter what I did to try and change my habits and routines, I fundamentally defaulted to the old way of doing things. I hadn't addressed mm. the systemic things in my life that were that, that actually were obstacles to change. Okay, yeah. And I feel like that actually, as we emerge, in order for us to be in a in a better place in terms of our faith, in terms of being followers of Jesus, it's to address the systemic things in our lives that are, would actually. I like the old wineskins. They don't allow us to change because they're the wrong containers for that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then and this is why I ended this passage with the reading I went to, which is they ended with a real offense at Jesus. Like, because, because we do so much want to put all of our hopes and our dreams into these things we created, which were, which worked once and which keep us safe. And any challenge to those things we created, we feel as a challenge to ourselves. And so we have to kill the thing that wants to change our systems. And that's what happens. They want to, this is, this is where they want to kill Jesus when he challenges their Sabbath and their synagogues and their law, you know, or their addiction to a particular vision they had for their law and their Sabbath and their synagogues. It's challenging stuff. So we're going to pray. Lord God, we thank you for the challenge it is to think and read scripture differently. To read in with that with that lens of as if as if you were speaking it to us. What would you say to us today? And as we address some of the systemic things in our lives, Lord, help us. Help us see those things that are hard to see, that stop us from receiving the new things that you're doing in our life. And for those of us that are weary, that are lacking rest right now, give us space for Sabbath, I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks for all your questions. Please come next week ready for... Well, we've already dipped into chapter three. Uh, we'll read it again uh, as I've divided it in that way. Uh, but we're going to keep reading into chapter three. And Stephen's going to be joining us again live. Come with your questions and uh, tune in next week, eight o'clock, uh, either live stream on slkt.online.church or on our Zoom webinar. And uh, have a wonderful week. This Thanks for joining fun. us, Stephen. These are always fun. We love it. Thank you so much. <laughs>